Hi there, my name is Tom Johnson, and today I'm going to join Doug Gottschfeld on an adventure in the boreal forest. Doug takes us to the southern edge of this massive ecosystem in the western Great Lakes region, and we get to visit with Connecticut warblers and great gray owls along the way. All right, let's head to the forest. The boreal forest is one of the most expansive and important habitats in the world. The North American boreal forest is mostly in Canada, and in fact it makes up 60% of the entire Canadian landmass. However, there are a few remnant patches of boreal forest that extend as far south as the USA's Great Lakes, and we've traveled to Minnesota to explore one of these boreal outposts. Well, Doug, this is the metropolis of Sachs, Minnesota, right here. Wait. Where are all the buildings? Where are all the people? Well, maybe there are lots of birds here. There are plenty of birds to choose from in the boreal forest, and we've decided to start our search with one of the most sought after, the seldom seen, and poorly named, Connecticut Warbler. Despite being one of North America's largest warblers, this species tends to be really difficult to track down, because it's very secretive. We began our search in the local spruce tamarack bogs. These bogs are one of the most well-known breeding habitats for the Connecticut Warbler. This is very exciting. We should be laying eyes on it. There it is again. Should be laying eyes on it. Just a couple minutes here if it stays where it is. The best way, and indeed virtually the only way, to find this species on the breeding grounds is to keep a sharp ear out for the resonant song of a male singing on territory. In this beautiful spruce tamarack bog, we're listening to the loud chanting song of a Connecticut warbler as a thunderstorm comes in from the west. This bird is staying pretty high up in the tamarack trees. A really really cool warbler and one of the things that we've been seeing as it's moving through the trees is that instead of hopping like most warblers do Connecticut warbler walks ponderously along a branch like an oven bird which is really different from most other warblers The forest floor here is covered in sphagnum moss. It's a little bit spongy underfoot, and there's a nice thick understory layer. Since we've been here watching this Connecticut warbler, he's been using different stories of the forest, different levels of the forest, but mostly spending time up high singing in the tamaracks on, uh, on horizontal branches. We've had some great looks at him, including the long yellow undertail coverts the really long olive wings, and the gray hood set off with a beautiful powder cake donut eye ring. Lots of mosquitoes, though. Having had our fill of mosquitoes, we retreated from the spruce tamarack bogs of Minnesota 
and decided to take a look for Connecticut warblers in some other habitats that they're known to breed in. This quest took us south into Wisconsin, at the very southern edge of their breeding range, and into a seemingly surprising habitat. Vast plantations of managed pine trees. Well, we didn't get our fill of Connecticut warbler in Minnesota, so we came here to the pine forest of northern Wisconsin. It's a very different habitat type than the spruce tamarack bog where we found Connecticut warbler in Minnesota. However, when we visited here, we realized that the forest's structure, the height of the trees, the density of the branches, and the ground cover were actually relatively similar looking to the spruce tamarack bog. The major difference here is moisture and soil type. We're on a very sandy soil as opposed to the wet sphagnum moss covered soil in the spruce tamarack. Connecticut warbler seems to love this just as much. There are a couple of birds that we can hear from this very spot singing away on territory. Right there. That loud ringing song is actually a bit reminiscent of the quality of northern water thrush, but this is a little brighter and sharper sounding overall, kind of back and forth. This is a ground nesting warbler. Connecticut warbler requires thick ground cover in which to place its well concealed cup nest. Lays the eggs in that nest and stays very, very inconspicuous during the breeding season. Except for the singing male who's rather conspicuous. In autumn, starting in late August, Connecticut warblers vacate their breeding grounds in the boreal forest and head all the way to the east coast of North America. From here, they take off on a remarkable journey over the ocean on a direct flight to South America, where they'll spend half the year, away from the prying eyes of humans. Our knowledge of Connecticut warbler on the wintering grounds is nearly non-existent. This site in Bolivia is one of the few areas where it has been seen in the winter. During their months here, they remain on or near the ground in the thick understory, where they are only detectable by their occasional call notes. This low stature, dense deciduous scrub is a virtually impenetrable habitat, nothing like where they breed. Luckily for us, those singing males in the boreal forest are a bit easier to see. Connecticut warblers aren't the only difficult to see birds in the Northwoods. Throughout our time traveling around these magnificent forests, we've been keeping an eye out for another very special animal, one that is even more difficult to find than Connecticut warbler during the breeding season. 